theyeshiva.net. Good morning, Bruchim Aboyim. To one and all, it's been a while. Glad to be back. I missed you. We missed you. Thank you. So we'll start a new Maimah today. It's been somewhat of a long break. I welcome you all. Thank you for coming and gracing us with your beautiful presence on this beautiful morning. Since this parish is Baloischa, so please turn to page 64, column 2. On top it should say Baloischa. Vizem Maisa HaMenoira. There's a few 64s because every Chumash, the page numbers repeat themselves. So you need to make sure it says on the top Baloischa. The truth is the, uh, yeah, or it's Lamed Bey's column four, if you want to go that way. But there's a lot of Lamed Bey's too, so. This is a mimer of the Balatanya, of the Alter Rebbe, of the year Tovkuf Nun Hey. Tovkuf Nun Hey, which would be uh, 1795. Zahav Ad Yerecha Ad Pircha. The opening of Parshas Baloischa, Hashem tells Moshe to tell Aaron, to speak to Aaron, Baloischa, Saneris, how to kindle the lights of the Menorah. Seven branches, and each of, the, each of the candles should face the middle one, as Rashi explains. And then the Torah concludes with this small portion, the opening... Uh, Four verses, Vizem Maisa Menorah. This was the construction. This is the way the Menorah was built. Miksha. Miksha means hammered out of one piece of gold. It wasn't made in different pieces and then welded together, which would have actually been much more convenient and easy because the Menorah was so intricate and so complex and so elaborate and so nuanced that to be able to take one piece of gold and hammer out all of the seven branches with all of the designs on each branch and on the base was extremely complex. Rashi says in the Pasuk, Vizeb Maisa Menorah, even this week, that Vizeh had to show it to him because it was difficult, Niskasha which also comes from the word miksha, it's also like kasha. It's hammered out from one piece and it was difficult. And then he says, ad yirecha, ad pircha. Ad yirecha means till the base. In other words, the entire menorah, from the top till the base, ad pircha. Pircha means until a flower. In other words, the base of the menorah, till the last flower, which was one of the designs, all of it had to be hammered out of one piece of gold. Ad Yerecha till the base, from top to bottom. Ad Percha till the last flower. Mikshahi, it's all hammered out of one piece of gold. That's the Pasa Kamara, Sheher Hashem is Moshe, Kenosa Samanair. According to the image that Hashem showed Moshe, that is how he built the candelabra, built the Menorah. This is the opening, four verses of Parshas Balois. This Maim is going to explain this whole mitzvah and many aspects of it from a deeper spiritual perspective, especially the focus on the miksha, on the one piece. Hine menorah nikras knesses Yisrael. The menorah, beyond just being a physical vessel, a candelabra, menorah, it also is the name for knesses Yisrael. Knesses Yisrael the gathering of Klal Yisrael, the gathering of all the souls of the Jewish people, is, is called the Menorah. Shehi Kedushas Klal Neshamas Yisrael. What do we mean by Knesset Yisrael? We don't just mean that Jews gather together. We're talking here the Kedusha that comes from the Klal of Neshamas Yisrael. There's the collective synergy that Neshamas Yisrael, all of the souls of the Jewish people together, represent and generate and create, that's called Knesset Yisrael. 
the gathering of all the souls as a cohesive and integrated and singular entity. The Kedusha that comes from Klal Neshama Yisrael, not just an individual Jew, every individual Jew is part of it, but it's the Kedusha that comes from the Klal Neshama Yisrael. Klal Neshama Yisrael generates a Kedusha. It embodies a holiness. It embodies... A, 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 um, an entity of holiness, of godliness, of transcendence. That's called the Menorah. As explained in the Menorah of Scharia, he's referring to here the Haftorah of Parshas Baloischa, comes from the prophet Scharia. And the prophet Scharia, Scharia Hanavi, describes the first era of the second Beis Hamikdash. There were the Nevi'im in the beginning of the second Beis HaMikdash, which was the last era of prophecy, the time of Esther. Saivs man Hanavua, she was at the last leg of prophecy. So there were the Nevi'im, the prophets of that time were included Chagai and Scharia and Malachi, which are the last books of the Tanakh. The last Svarim of the Tanakh, the last prophets are Chagai, Scharia, and Malachi. The Aftar of this week of Baaloischa, is from Scharia Hanavi. And there he describes the opening years of the second Beis Hamikdash. The name of the Kohen Gadol was Yehoshua. And um, it's a whole story. Yehoshua's children were married out of the Jewish faith because during the destruction of the first Beis Hamikdash, the Jews who remained in Eretz Yisrael for the, la for, for the most part assimilated. And when the Jews from Bavel came back to rebuild the second Beis Hamikdash, they had to completely rejuvenate the Jewish community in Eretz Yisrael. This was the work of Ezra and Nehemia, Zerubavel, the Anshe Knesset Sagdoila, who, were found, who, who created a renaissance. Yeshua the Kohen Gadol, uh, his children married out. So uh, Sky saw this vision where uh, the Satan was uh, lambasting and trying to destroy Yeshua the high priest because of his children. And God got very upset at him and he said the famous words, Yiger Hashem Becha HaSatan. Hashem will get angry at the Satan. Haloiza Ud Mutzal Me'esh. Yeshua the Kohen Gadol is an Ud, a strand that was saved from the fire. You know, uh, an Ud is a... Um, huh? Firebrand. Firebrand, yeah. A firebrand. An ud mutzel meyesh. How could you, uh, how could you, um, you chastise and be so negative about Yehoshua? That's the beginning of the Haftar. Towards the end, that's what he's referring to. The angel asks Chaya, what do you see? So he says he sees a menorah. He sees a menorah of Kula, a golden menorah. And he sees uh, the seven lamps. And he also sees two olive trees on the right and on the left. And the olive trees are producing oil that are trickling into, flowing into, into the menorah. And he asks, what is it? What is it? What, what am I seeing? So the Malach tells him, what you're seeing is, Zed var Hashem el Zerubavel Emer. What you're seeing is the word of God to Zerubavel who was one of the leaders of the time who rebuilt Judaism in the beginning of Bayashani. These are the words of Not through uh, physical might or strength, but through my spirit, you will, you will succeed. So the Balatanya teaches, what do we see from here? Yeah. When the Malach tells him, he asks, what is this menorah that I'm seeing? He says, you know what these things are. So he says, I don't know. He says, hello, Yadata, you know what it is. He says, I don't know. So the Malach tells him, let me tell you what it is. This is a Zedvar Hashem that what? It's not just. What you're seeing, he says, what do I see? So he says, what you're seeing is, this is the word of God through Zerubbabel, that it's not going to be your physical strength that will uh, guarantee your eternity, but your connection to Hashem. So the way you understand it, usually Zedvar Hashem is just an introduction. 
In other words, this is the word of God that he wants to convey to you that the whole system of this menorah is not happening through human effort. It's happening naturally through divine effort. But it's much deeper than that. Zedvar Hashem is part of what he saw. It's not just, you saw something, let me tell you what Hashem is communicating. Because it's clear that Hashem is communicating. He already asked what he's trying to communicate. So he says, the pshat is ha hidvar Hashem. Zed dvar Hashem is, the menorah that you're seeing represents dvar Hashem. What do we mean? Hu Hashem bedvar Hashem shemayim nasu. Pasuk says in Tehillim that through the word of God, the heaven was created. Hamachai yikaloilim is, and this dvar Hashem gives life to all of the worlds. Shehi knesses Yisrael. And this is represented by what we're saying, knesses Yisrael. Why is it called knesses Yisrael? Al shem shemachneses besoich ebchines alakus. Because she gathers into her collective, the divine energy which vitalizes the world, Hanikri Yisrael, which is called Yisrael, or also Seiv of Kalalman. It's the vitality, the godliness that encompasses and it's all of the worlds and all of the worlds equally. Or as the Pasuk says in Parshas Vayishlach, Vayikri Eloi, Kel Elekei Yisrael. Hashem called Yaakov. It's one of the interpretations in Rashi and in Medrash. He called Yaakov Kael Eleke Yisrael. And Chazal say the astounding interpretation, it's really the Bosak, that Hashem called Yaakov Kael. Hashem called Yaakov Kael, which literally means the God, the God of Yisrael, which is difficult to understand. One interpretation is Vayikol Kael Eleke Yisrael that goes on Yaakov, that Yaakov built an altar and he gave the altar a name that represented remembering Hashem. But the literal interpretation, which Rashi also brings, and the Medrash brings, is, Vayikra loy kele leke Yisrael, he called Yaakov kele leke Yisrael. So one of the explanations is that Yaakov embodies all Neshama Yisrael. Yaakov is the patriarch, he's the father, who encompasses Knesset Yisrael. What is Knesset Yisrael? Knesset Yisrael is kele leke Yisrael. It contains within itself, it embodies the flow of godliness, a lekus, Soiv of Kalalman, which gives life to all of the worlds. Bidvar Hashem, Shamayim Nasu, and that's what he calls the Menaira. Zedvar Hashem. This is the Dvar Hashem. Vihi Kailelis Kolhan Hashamas. And this Knesset Yisrael, it's not about one Jew or another Jew. It encompasses all of the souls of Israel. Migdoile Hat Sadikim Va'ad Pchuse Erech. When we speak about Knesset Yisrael, there's never anybody left out. We're not talking here about an individual Jew with his or her virtues and great qualities. That's a separate issue. Knesset Yisrael is the Kedusha of Kalal Neshama Yisrael. If it's a Neshama Yisrael, it's part of Knesset Yisrael. It's an indivisible whole that includes the, the godliness that comes forth from the collective body of Neshama Yisrael where all the Neshamas generate the Kedusha. And this is a Kedush of Knesset Yisrael. It's not, it's, it could be manifested individually in one Jew. But Knesset Yisrael is more than one person or another person or a third person or ten people or a hundred people. Klal Neshama Yisrael together is a real entity. There's something called Neshama Yisrael and the Klal of Neshama Yisrael. The collective the Jewish people. Not just down here at any period of history. That too. But Knesset Yisrael is, is something that includes all Neshama Yisrael. Meta, meta historical of all of history and it includes everybody there from the greatest tzaddikim the most righteous ad pchuseyarech pchuseyarech means those that you would think their value is pachos is much lower but it includes everybody valkein ksiv and that's why it says who does Hashem say this to el zerubavl it's a message to zerubavl on a literal level Zerubavl was one of the important personalities of the time. But why is this message, Davka to Zerubavl? So Zerubavl <laughs> is Adam HaMavulbul. It represents somebody who's confused. What's confused? Toivim Ra. The good with the negative. Zera Adam Vizera Behema. The seed of a human and the seed of an animal. Zerubavl is two words. Zera, zer, zeru, bavel. Bavel is from the word mevulbel. That's what he's teaching here. So zeru, bavel is zera, mevulbel. As famished. Between the seed of a human 
and the seed of a behemoth, which is an expression in Yechez called Zerah Adam and Zerah Behemoth. What's Pshat? Shemesim Atzmik Behemoth. Sometimes a person can regard himself and live and see himself and live as, as a behemoth, as a beast. And the one example he finds for this is Shemahalech <laughs> Achasichena. He hears a juicy conversation, so he's pulled into it. Even though if he would deliberate, he would be able to appreciate that this is inappropriate. It's an inappropriate conversation. But when the person, Zerah Adam, is mixed up with Zerah Behem, so he's mavulbul, he's confused. So then the person often doesn't have a compass that directs him and navigates him or her. So mahalach hachasich no. There's a juicy conversation about somebody. How could you not join it? So he gets pulled into the sichena. This is one of the simonim of a behema. So that's his rubavel. Because the menore, Knesset Yisrael, is not only certain souls of Neshama Yisrael. It's the entire body of Neshama Yisrael. Every Neshama is part of Knesset Yisrael. And in that sense, there's no difference between the highest and the lowest. So who is he saying? And he's saying, I know it's a mixture. I know there's a lot of types of Jews. From the highest to the lowest, Sadikim to Pchuseyerich. But Zedvar Hashem, the Klal of Neshama Yisrael and the Kedusha generates and encompasses all. And sometimes this consciousness, the Jews themselves can't see. But very often you see that non-Jews are very sensitive to it. And in that sense, will not distinguish between Jew and Jew in this Nekuda. There's something about Knesset as well that every Jew is a part of. So even though between ourselves, <laughs> I once spoke somewhere, it was a, an interesting matzav. So I said, you look at Sefer Bamidbar, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting comment. You read through Sefer Bamidbar, most of it, the first section of it, it's basically... As the Gemara puts it in Shpesech the Shabbos, Koftazayin, it's full of Puronius. It's full of negative occurrences. Parshas Baloischa, they run away from Har Sinai. And then there's a Misoyin in them, chronic complainers. And Tavera, fire. And then there's Misavim, Misavu, Tavera, they're complaining about the food. They miss the sushi in Egypt. And the leeks and the cucumbers and the onions and the garlics. They're begging for meat, they want meat and they want fish and there's a slav and then that becomes a disaster and a crisis. You finish with Baloy's Chazamaisa with, with Miriam and Moshe and Miriam becomes a leper. That's the end of Baloy. You finish with that, you think now will be peace. Amaisa with the spies. Shlach is another catastrophe. The end of Shlach is Amaisa with Amakosha Shaitzim, the first Shabbos. Somebody has to chop wood on Shabbos. You, we're done already. Okay, 40 in the now is Amaisa Koirach suddenly. Uh, Kairach emerges, and Kairach itself is a disaster after a disaster with a Magefa. Sehet it doesn't stop. You come to Parshas Chukas, <laughs> it's a Maise Vaita with snakes and complaining, and then the story with the water, Moshe hitting the rock, and Moshe not going to Eretz Yisrael, Aaron not going into Eretz Yisrael, Miriam passes away. Disaster after disaster. You look at the Jewish people, and you say there's not a Monday or Thursday they were let by without making a revolution, complaining, rebelling. Yeah, then they'll repent and then they'll rebel again. Suddenly you come to Parshas Balak. What's Balak? Bilam wants to curse the Jewish people. Instead, he starts talking about the Jewish people. What he says about the Jews. There's no poetry and prose about the Jewish people like coming from the mouth of, of Bilam to the point that when they had to decide with which Pasuk we should start all of davening, I mean, they couldn't find any other Pasuk just from Bilam. Which is Bilam's Pasuk. The whole Navu about Mashiach is from Bilam. The most beautiful thing said about the Jewish people come from Bilam after. You're going through by Midbar. And it's very powerful because when you're looking from inside, there's the divisions, there's the problems, there's the challenges. Bilam has a, a bird's eye view from the outside. And Bilam says, let me tell you, I know the world. Yeah. 
So sometimes the perspective of Knesset Yisrael is, can't be seen always by the person who is himself invested in it. It's the bird's eye view of the Kedusha that's generated by Nisham Yisrael. And sometimes people who dislike Jews pick up on it in a perverse way. They utilize it, but they pick up on it. So when Haman sees that Mordechai is not bowing down to him, so it says, of yad Mardechai Levade, the Megillah says. He doesn't want to kill only Mordechai. Why? Ki igidu loy es am Mordechai. They told him about the nation of Mordechai. So the first time Haman ever heard about the Jewish people? The Gemara says Haman worked for Mordechai. He was a servant, a slave of his. He gidu loy es am Mordechai. They told him about the nation of Mordechai. So he decided he has to exterminate every Jew. Every single Jew. What did they tell Haman? Haman understood that there's an Ikuda in Mar- You're upset at Mardukai, so kill Mardukai. What do you want from every Jew? A lot of Jews are bowing down to you. They weren't all not bowing down to you. They were bowing down. They were bowing down. So you want Mardukai, so, so get rid of Mardukai. Haman saw Am Mardukai. He saw he saw there's an akud in every Jewish child, a baby in a crib, an infant still in the bosom of its mother. He saw in every Jewish child a mardechai, a shtikl mardechai. The kedusha of klal neshamis Yisrael is manifested in every point of it. Zerubavl, from the highest to the lowest. And the same was true in Haman in our generation, in the previous generation. The same thing. The venom, the venom, the hatred that was directed towards the Jewish people, you would think, would be directed more towards what they called herabiners. And it was. Tzadikim, Kedoshim, chief uh, spiritual leaders. And there was plenty of venom there. But a Jew who, who's, who's, who calls himself an atheist, who's, who's intermarried, <laughs> who doesn't give a, who doesn't give a, who doesn't care about Judaism? <laughs> it's the same hatred, the same venom. If there was Jewish blood flowing through your sinews, achas dasoi. What is it? So there's a pasuk in Tehillim, may oivai techakmeni. I become smart. Literally, it means make me smarter than my enemies. But it says in Svarim, may oivai techakmeni. I become smart from my enemies. From your enemies, you could become smart. The Balatanya once said, from the things that you don't want to do, you could discover what you have to do. <laughs> you become smart from your enemies, from things that you don't like. That's probably where your mission is. Right? If there's something... But there's also another interpretation. From our enemies, we could gain a lot of wisdom about Judaism. When you see the sinner that evil has to the Jewish people, you could understand the Kedusha of Knesset Yisrael. Why? Evil is allergic to good. Unholiness is allergic to holiness. And it's true till today. What's the greatest... What do they say in English? Tell me who your enemies are and I'll tell you who you are. Okay? You ask one question. Who are the greatest enemies of the Jewish people? And you'll know right away who the Jewish people are. And throughout history, who? Hitler? That means you're in a good place. (laughs) Stalin? You're in a good place. Who hates you? Iran? Syria? Hezbollah? Hamas? People who will destroy their own children. They don't care. If these are the ones who hate you, it's the greatest compliment. (laughs) You have to look. Who hates you? Who hates you? Hates regimes that are debased, that are morally impoverished. We have the worst abuses of, 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 of human decency and human rights. If they hate you, that means you're doing there's something right. There's something right. I'm not trying to glorify the hate, Chas Vashon. What I'm trying to say is, you see that the evil is allergic to goodness. It's, uh, Hitler sensed the Kedusha of Knesset Yisrael and it drove him mad. He didn't even know how deeply it drove him mad. But it drove him mad. Vaharaya, he sacrificed 
precious resources he needed for his war efforts just to exterminate European Jewry. There were advisors, I don't know if you're familiar, there were top German advisors who told him, there was a famous German advisor who told him, what you're doing doesn't make sense. You have many fronts open, precious resources, money and manpower, you're taking away from what's most important to win the war, to exterminate the last Jew. So what did he do to that person? Because behind everything there was the Nekudah, the Ike Nekudah is the extermination of Klal Yisrael. Why? Because evil feels the en- its enemy. And we- where was it directed to? Every Jew. No difference. No difference what you look like. No difference what you say you look like. There's something that comes from Knesset Yisrael, Klal Nisham Yisrael. This is Zerubavl. It could be confused, Zera Adam, Zera Behema, Zera Bavel. Valzeh Amara Kosov, on this the Pasuk says, huh? I can see it boiling inside, something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I once heard a shear on a tape from Rabbi Yashaber Salavechik. Rabbi Salavechik. It was many, many years ago. I don't remember all the details. But he said something. It stuck with me. There's a story in Gemara. There's a whole machlaikas in Rishonim. When are you allowed to die? al Kiddush Hashem and when not? For example, there are the three sins that a Jew is obligated to give up his life. But what about other things? If a person wants to sacrifice his life, not to eat treif. There were Jews like this in the Russian gulags or in the, in the camps. You don't want to eat on Yom Kippur, but you're not going to survive. You don't want to eat treif, but you're not going to survive. Eight days of Pesach. I know Jews who were in Siberia, eight days of Pesach. There was bread. You didn't eat bread, you're not going to survive. They didn't want to eat chametz on Pesach. But to save your life, you're allowed to eat chametz on Pesach. But they didn't want to. So it's a question. The Rambam says, No, you have to sin. You have to do the Avera. If not, you're considered a person who's guilty for forfeiting his life, and other, it, it's a machlaikas in the Rishonim. So I think he said that the Ramban brings, I have to look it up, I heard it many years ago, that the Ramban brings a story from Meseches Gitten, that there were the 300 children that Rome captured, placed them on a boat, and they were taking them to Rome. And they felt what's going to happen to them, and they started to have a conversation they asked the question of those who are who drown in the sea are gonna come back. And one of the boys said, Mi Bashon Ashiv, Mi Mitsulis Yam, he brought Psukim and Tehillim, and they all jumped in. They all jumped in and died. So one of the Rishonim brings this as a proof that you're allowed to. So the Byashaber Salavechik, he gave a scream. He says, Ich will ich fragen. He said, Verat ye can't besser learnen. The Rambam, see the 300 kinderlach of Hashif. Who knew how to learn better? The Rambam or the 300 boys on a ship? What are you bringing a proof? You're rejecting the Rambam? The Rambam knew kala You're rejecting the Rambam from their behavior? So he said, Elamai, the pshat is when 300 Jewish children do something, when 300 children do something, it embodies a Ruach HaKadosh. It embodies divine inspiration. Intellectually, they may not be able to know how to learn with the Rambam. But if this was their decision, this becomes Torah. So it reminded me, I was once, uh, I was once at a Levaya near a, an elderly Jew. He's already on Eilam Amos. He lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. His name was Rabbi David Edelman. And he told me, that he was learning in Taim Chitmimim, in the Lubavitch Yeshiva in 770, in the early 1940s. And he was learning a Pnei Yeshua. On Gemara, he was learning a Pnei Yeshua. In walks, who would become later the future Lubavitch Rebbe, they called him then the Ramash. His father-in-law was still alive, the Rayats, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe. He walks in, I think he said to get a Sefer, and he walked by his table, he was learning Pnei Yeshua. So he took a look. So he told me that the Rebbe tells him, he says, interessant. The Pnei Yeshua wrote many other svarim. 
But nobody knows them. <laughs> nobody knows their names. Nobody learns them. Because the Pnei Yeshua became a, uh, a household name in the, in the world of Torah, in the world of Yeshivas. Everybody learns. On the Gemara, you learn the Pnei Yeshua. He says he has other Svarim. But they like, um, they were in the sidelines. They didn't make it, so to speak. So he says the Pshat is, there are tzaddikim who have ruach hakodesh. They have divine inspiration. He said tzedah pesandish. Klal Yisrael hot a collective ruach hakodesh. In Yiddish, he said. Klal Yisrael has collective ruach hakodesh. There's something called the ruach hakodesh of the Jewish people. You have ruach hakodesh. Have ruach hakodesh? No. Maybe you, not me. There's something called Klal Yisrael has a collective Ruach HaKodesh. You want to call it the Zeitgeist of Klal Yisrael. There's a collective Ruach HaKodesh. Its instincts are holy. Or as the Gemara says in Meseches Pesachim, they didn't know what to do about Erev Pesach when it's Shabbos. What do you do with the sheep and the goat? How you bring it to the Beis Hamidosh? How you bring the knives? So Hillel said, Hanach lehen li Yisrael. Im eina neviyim heim, b'nei neviyim heim. Don't worry about the Jews. They may not be prophets, but they're children of prophets. Their instincts are healthy. So it's Klal Yisrael has a collective Ruach HaKodesh, and it's sensed that the Seif of Pnei Yeshua on the Gemara is a Seif of Ruach HaKodesh. So he's saying, who, who, who is this? Sometimes you have an individual. This, it's not an individual. It's a Klal Yisrael the Ruach HaKodesh. What is it? It's the Kedusha that comes from Neshama Yisrael as a collective. Yeah. And who's included in this? Everybody. There's no exception to this. says, On this the Pasuk says, This is the Maisa of the Menorah. This is how you build the Menorah. Meaning... Somebody wants to transcend their own ra, their own negativity. Really, the word ra comes from the word brokenness. Kaisal ra'ua. And become a menoira. What's pshat to become a menoira? What's a menoira? A menoira was basically a channel for light. The Gemara says a menach is v'chila oira hutzarech. It's not like he needs the, the Mishkan was dark or the Beis Hamikdash was dark and needed light. That wasn't the Menorah. Ella mimena yotzis er lechalaylam kulay. It was a source of light for the world. What does it mean? You become a Menorah. You become a Menorah basically means you become an ambassador of light. When I look at a Menorah, what do I see? I see light. So I now have brightness. There's a Menorah in a room. I could see what I'm doing. There's a Menorah in a room. I get enriched by the light, by the heat. By the passion, by the glow. What does it mean a person becomes a menorah? You become a source of light. So if somebody meets you, they come away from the conversation enlightened, pun intended. They come away from the conversation brighter, wiser, warmer. When you say Knesset Yisrael is called a menorah, what does it mean? That Knesset Yisrael and its collective are ambassadors of light. They carry the divine light into the world. And for that, they are often not forgiven. Yeah, there was once a non-Jew who explained anti-Semitism. He said, people don't like alarm clocks. <laughs> Nobody likes alarm clocks. What do you do when the alarm clock rings? You press snooze. Knesset Yisrael is the collective alarm clock of civilization from the day Avram Avinu stepped foot on the earth. That's what it is. It's an alarm clock. Sometimes the Jews don't see themselves that way, but everybody else does. You look at yourself, well, I'm not an alarm clock. I myself am snoozing off. <laughs> but if you're part of Knesset Yisrael, you're part of that. You carry God. Atem Edai. Yeshaya Hanavi says about Jews two words. You are God's witnesses. What did the Greeks used to say? Kill the witness. The mafia also say that. The first thing you got to do in a story is what? The gangsters will tell you. What's the first thing? You have to find out who sought and you get rid of them, huh? Yeah. In Ruslan, they knew this very well, right? You always kill the witnesses. Atem Eidai. You got to get rid of the witnesses. 
Jewish people are witnesses for a living moral God. What do you have to do? You have to get rid of the witnesses. Who are the witnesses? No difference. You could call yourself a communist, atheist, Atem Eidai. Shayanov says, you are my witnesses. It's very hard to understand anti-Semitism if you don't understand this. Because it's too irrational, it doesn't make sense. Where it comes from, like where it comes from. Even today in America, where, where does it come from? Like what do people have with Jews? I mean, what do we want already? At the end of the day, what, what? Uh, I mean, we know Jews, we're not perfect people. But what, uh, what, what do Jews really want? <laughs> to live normal lives with their families, to be left alone. It's, it, 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 if it would have been a disease, most research would go in to study this disease. It's 4,000 years old. It exists in every country. It mutates constantly. And it exists in countries when they never saw Jews. It's, 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 it's beyond rationale. It's beyond rationality. And that's the Kedusha that comes out from Klal Neshama Sisro. Atameida, you're my witnesses. It's a whole different, it's, it's a different experience. Would you say that there's more anti-Semitism at times and there's more moral depravity? By the Jews? No, no, in the world. There's no question. Hashem tells Avram the first words, Avarcham avarachacha. I'm going to bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. We always see it as a, as a blessing, as a promise, as a prediction. Those who bless you will be blessed. It's much more than that. It's a historical statement. If you want to ever judge a society, you want to go live in a country, and you want to know, is it a blessed place or is it a cursed place? Ask one question. How they treat the Jews. You'll go right away. Stalin started with the Jews. He didn't end with the Jews. He created hell on earth for everybody. He killed, I don't know, 50 million people, 40 million people plenty of Jews they all start with the Jews they never end with the Jews they, they say that the Jews are the mi miners canaries of history you know what a miners canaries is it's a great marshal miners before they go down to mine for coal they send down canary birds canaries are very sensitive to noxious fumes if the canaries come back you're safe if the canaries come back diseased and ill and die, you know not to go down there because there's poison. Because the canaries will feel it immediately. So before you send down the miners, you send down the canaries. So somebody once said that the Jewish people have been the miners, canaries of history. Which means wherever there's poison, they're just going to be targeted first. Take a look. Take a look. Suicide bombings didn't start in London and in the Twin Towers, and in Madrid, and in Bombay, in Mumbai. Where did it start? It started in Israel. Everybody said, it's a Jewish problem. It's a Jewish problem. Come September 11th, it's a world problem. The Jews are the first ones, because they represent the Kedusha and the goodness of godliness in the world. So with this poison, it right away attracts, and it's attracted to the canaries. So God told Avram, those who bless you will be blessed. It's a historical fact. You look how a society treats the Jews, and you'll see if it's a good society for their own people. Forget the Jews, for their own people. That's why anti-Semitism is not a problem for Jews alone. It's a problem for any good person. Where anti-Semitism flourishes... Ultimately, good people suffer. This is not Jewish propaganda. This is, uh, this is a truth of history. You could look. Look at any, at any society, how they treated the Jews. Who suffered most from Hitler? The Jews suffered, but how many other people suffered? I mean, what's that famous saying, right? Not all victims were Jews, all Jews were victims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So-called normal people? Um, have their anti-Semitism. In other words, <coughs> other words, to say that Arafat and whoever other people like that, people, they're evil, they're crazy. But saying America, someone like the said, you know, Tom, every time you hear about the Sackville family, and said, their grandparents are immigrants. 
They have to admit. Well, you, now you're touching on the issue of self-hating Jews. That's a whole other problem. <laughs> That's Jews who don't know how to deal with the fact that they're Jewish. That's a different phenomenon. It's connected. It's connected. Because if you don't understand who the Jewish people are, anti-Semitism could cause you to become self-hating. You know, if your child is thrown out from every single school in the tri-state area, right? At some point, the principal is going to tell you, it's not the schools. <laughs> you understand? Jews have been thrown out from every single country they ever lived in, besides maybe five. New Zealand, Australia, America, and maybe another two. You tell me one country in the world that they lived, they weren't expelled from. So at some point, you got to look at yourself and you say, you know what? Maybe it's us. <laughs> so you become a self-hating Jew. I understand the process very well. 2,000 years of being thrown out of every school. At some point, you look in the mirror and you say, you know what? I got the issue. If I could change my nose, if I could assimilate, if I could only be this and be that, they'll stop hating me. Because if you're not toifus, this Indian, if you don't chap, if you don't grasp the nekuda of Knesset Yisrael, so then you start blaming it on yourself and you blame it on all types of side factors. Maybe we're too rich, maybe we're too poor, maybe we eat too much sushi, maybe we eat too little sushi, maybe we look different, maybe we dress different, maybe we're marrying the wrong people, maybe we're hanging out in the wrong circles, maybe we're too religious. Whatever it is, you're always looking for yourself as, as the cause of guilt. So that creates a whole new type of inner uh, ambivalence and dysfunction. Because you start hating yourself and you're not sure who you are, right? Like to the school, in the school motion, when the kid is a genius, instead of recognizing that, right. not giving him medication. Oh, tells it. <laughs> the reason all the schools expelled him is because they can't deal with him. Because he's supposed to change the world. <laughs> so what do you do? You start medicating him. And you make him a sugar and then he starts hating himself. So Knesset Yisrael is a tremendous koyach. It's the most spiritual power in the world. And you cannot eliminate it by making believe it doesn't exist. That only frustrates. Huh? It only frustrates themselves and frustrates others. Zerubavl, yeah. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. Yeah. It's the same point. I said on Shavuos, there's a word from the Gary Rebbe, the Beis Yisro. It's a very sharp word. He said, in all the brachas in the morning, we thank God. You didn't make me this, you didn't make me this, you didn't make me this. Why don't you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Shaloya Sani Behema. You didn't make me a Behema. So the Gary Rebbe said, because it's a Suffolk bracha levatala. <laughs> We're not yet sure if it's going to be a, a valid bracha. Let's see how the day goes. <laughs> this is a real get of art. <laughs> it's a Suffolk bracha levatala. Says <laughs> to, <laughs> I'm not sure, Leia Sani Beim. So the Torah says, If you want to go out of a state of rant, turn yourself into a menorah. In other words, to be able to experience what it's pshat to be Knesset Yisrael. What's pshat to be Knesset Yisrael? It means to be a menorah. Who are the Jewish people? What is this Knesset Yisrael? So the word is menorah. They are the carriers of light. They are the ambassadors of light. They embody the light of the Reboi Nishaloylam in the world. That is the definition of Knesset Yisrael. They are a menorah. So if you want to become that person, an ambassador of light, which practically means, you know, we all know this in life, once in a while you meet a person, even for a few minutes, and you go away and you feel more bright, you feel more light. Sometimes you meet a person, you feel more dark. But... At every moment, every interaction you have during the day, one of two things happen. Either people go away from the interaction feeling more light or feeling more darkness. Every conversation, even a good morning, a good Shabbos, good afternoon, how are you? Every interaction, I can either be in a state of brokenness or I can be in a state of a menorah. I become a source of light. So he says, How do you become a menorah? In other words, how do you 
identify in a conscious way this dimension of Knesset Yisrael that you really represent, but that it shouldn't only be unconscious in your inner core, but it should actually, it should actually reflect your life, that you become a menorah. You become a symbol of light for people. A symbol of light. Shachin Yeah, you become, you become, yeah. You become the Shachin So he says, Yasa Kesedir Hazah. So the Rebbeinu Shalom says, V'zeh ma'isa menorah, this is the Seder. The first thing is Miksha Zahav. What's Miksha? Shemitchil ha'ya kikar agol. First they had around, um, a kikar was a very, very heavy weight of gold. So it was around, uh, what is it called? Ignit. Uh, ingit. Ingit of gold, round. Upidish Rashi. Rashi says, because the Torah says it was kikar zav. So he says, eshes shall kikar zav. A very large ingot of a heavy, heavy weight of gold. It was the weight known as a kikar. Hoysa, it was. Umakish bekornis. And the builder took a cornice. A cornice is a hammer. And he pounded the gold with a hammer. V'chuli, etc. L'fashet evarea. Ultimately to expand its limbs. Meaning that the gold should be fashioned through the hammer into all of its parts and shapes. V'yidei hakos hakornis. What happens as you strike the hammer? Yoyred zohav el yoyin lamata v'tachten oyla lamayla achinis arif kol hazov mizbatl mitzorosa arishu. What happens is the gold that's on the top goes on the bottom. The gold that's on the bottom rises to the top because there's a whole mishmash. So even though in the beginning you have one solid round ingot of gold, but now as you hammer it out, everything changes positions. That which is on the top ends up on the bottom of the menorah. That which is on the bottom ends up on top of the menorah. Until the whole gold gets submished, gets mixed up, and the original tzura, the original form, is nullified. As it takes on the new shape of the menorah, hammered out with the hammer of the original gold. The first step in becoming a menorah is a person has to use this quality within himself, which is l'shaber hamidois sheyizbatlu mitzurosam. The ability to be able to hammer out my midos, that they should take on a new shape from their original form. Kemaimer, as it says in Pirkei Yavis, batal ritzoyincha mipnei ritzoyincha. Very often, when a person looks at themselves, we have a certain shape. That which belongs to me, that which doesn't belong to me, das was past famir, das was past nish famir. We have a certain tzura, a certain form. L'shaber hamidashi is batlum mitzurasa means a person has to be able to transcend that. And it's not so easy. In other words, I may tell myself, this behavior is off limits for me. This telephone call I will not make. This relationship I will not cultivate. This is my system and I remain fixed. And it becomes a trap. And if it's gold, it becomes a beautiful trap. But essentially, I remain stuck in my comfort zone and I'm not ready to shock myself. I'm not ready to surprise myself. I'm not ready to transcend myself. To taking a hammer, to taking a hammer and reshaping the tzura in a person's life, it means the ability for me to be able to go outside of my fixed comfort zone, to be able to shock myself, to be able to take on a new tzura, never to remain stuck, that this is my form. Like people say, this is who I am. You like it? Good. You don't like it? Find somebody new. Sometimes that becomes the greatest excuse for paralysis, and it's coming from a fear. It's coming from a fear or from a laziness or from a trauma. The ability to become a menorah, the first thing is, I have to be able to challenge everything. I have to be able to recalculate. I have to be able to reevaluate. To be able to listen to something new, to be able to grow into something new, to be able to aspire to something new, even though that may include failure, that may include trial and error. What was the father once told his son? He says, son, I'm not afraid if you aim high and miss. I'm afraid if you aim low and you never miss. 
<laughs> if you aim high and miss is good. My problem is that you never want to miss. You always want to be able to predict perfect success. How can you predict perfect success? You always try exactly the same thing, the same thing you did the last 50 years. You do for the next 50 years and success is predictable. There's only one problem. A minority can't become from that. So that's the idea. She is batlu mitzurasa. The ability that I can take my midas and take them out from the tzura. I'm not trapped in this particular form. Now sometimes I have to use a hammer, meaning the mid is afraid of that because it's called the comfort zone. You know, we all have things, but we'll, we'll, it's very hard for us. Like, you know, could you do something today that will shock your system? That <laughs> Could you do something today that, you know, your, your inner voice says, no, 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 let's not do this. Whether it's, it could be a telephone call. But you know that telephone call, somebody else might not even appreciate how hard it is. You know it's hard for you. This may be a relationship that went sour. This may be an issue. But to be able to do something that really I have to go be, I have to go the extra mile. I have to change my tzura. I have to go out of that, that picture. We all have pictures who we are, right? I have a picture of who I am. I'm not just talking about a physical picture on your phone. I mean a psychological picture. It's called your profile. Your passport picture. What's not a passport picture? Passport picture means the picture by which you travel through life. <laughs> this is who I am, and this is that's what a passport picture really represents. This is who I am, and this is how I travel through life. Can you reinvent that picture? That concept of, of, of reinvention, complete transformation, is the first step, is the first step in my summonator. The fighting good needles too. Ah, frexta gute shaila, frexta gute shaila. He wants to know if it applies to good midas too. It applies to good midas too. Yeah, of course in a different way, <laughs> but it applies to all midas. Yeah. So if you're a big learner, it's it's you should become more more chesed. If you're more chesed, you should change to be more something else. For good. That's right. Battle ritzayin chama pnei ritzayin. Right. You could change. You could work on yourself. So when you say in the many times you meet people, yeah. Like always, there is a grain of truth in that attitude. In other words, some people are busy changing for every person's expectations. So that's that's not. In other words, that there's a there's a there's a um, a kernel of truth in that that a person has to be able to develop what we call a certain spine, right? And, and, and not just conform to every person's expectations. But that's not what we're talking about. What do they call it? A chameleon? Uh, so, but that's not what we're talking about. You know, I change every, every way. I have to change my skin to be able to fit into you and fit into you and fit into you. And then what are you left with? There's nothing there. But here we're talking a much deeper Nakuda. Right. I meet people and they are unpleasant in some way and say, look here, you know, it's me, take it to me. Right. Right, right, right. It's we protect ourselves behind armor, behind shielded armor, and we will not allow any type of uh, reflection to really help us grow into something greater. Okay, we'll be mafsuk here. With Reb Chanina ben Tradin, yeah, you remember? Torah Er Pashas told us. Yeah, very good, very good. Reb Chanina ben Tradin, the Gemara of Eid Zara, yeah, that Mani lechaya elam haba. You remember? Reb Yosi ben Kisma. So your question is, is that, is that, is that what the Baal is saying now? That, uh, that I have to, to, to change that? To grow in order to grow? A Jew is learning Torah Yom and Valayla, he, he doesn't have to change that. It's a good thing. Vagisa <laughs> What we're talking about is not to get trapped by my own surah. Where will it express itself? Sometimes there's a moment that you're called on to do something that you have to do now. If all there was is my comfort zone, I will not be able to rise up to that moment. That's what we're talking about. But it could be in Paul Mamish, the person is, 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 
is doing extraordinary things. So you have to be careful not to discourage that at all. The question is that if that can sometimes become also a trap. Because it becomes like, you know, this is my comfortable place. And I have great excuses. Look, ah, you know. There's the famous story with the Balatanya, you know, with the Mittler Rebbe. It brings it out, I think, very well. Uh, the Alter Rebbe lived in the, on the second floor in the house, and his son, who took him over, the Mittler Rebbe, Rebbe Dov, lived in the bottom floor. The Balatanya's son, the Mittler Rebbe, was known, and he had a very big mind, and he could, like, when he learned or davened, he wasn't present. So uh, it was at night, and he was ba- babysitting. <laughs> and his baby fell out of the crib. And he was learning, and he didn't hear. He didn't notice. The Balatanya was upstairs. He was also learning, but he heard a baby cry. So he comes down, and he sees his son is sitting and learning, and he doesn't notice what's happening. So the Balatanya didn't disturb him. He picked up the baby and he calmed him down and soothed the child and then put the child back into the crib when he fell asleep and went back to his house. A while later, he called in his son and he said that uh, it should never happen in your life that you're learning and your learning ultimately makes you deaf to a kol yelled boicha to the sound of a child weeping. He says, if the Torah that you're learning ultimately makes you not be able to hear the voice of the child weeping, you have to re-examine the Torah that you're learning. First taste. Now some people would say, it's a gewalde kamayla. You learn and your kid falls out of the crib and you don't know. It's a gewalde thing, right? Huh? The greatest thing. Such a beautiful thing. But Al Rebbe didn't say so. He said Fakert. And it's not a Pasha to Indian. Because the Indian that I don't hear anybody, that's my own Shlemos. It's my own brilliance. It's my own perfection. But a child weeping, it's not my perfection. And the same is true on a more collective place. In other words, for my perfection, what do I have to hear a baby crying? I'm, I'm in Taira. But when you have Batar at Sinai, so then your learning doesn't make you deaf to the child crying. That's the point. You understand? The Rebbe once said over the story, so he said <laughs> that the fact that the Rebbe lived on the highest floor it's not some uh, a technical detail. It's a, there's a deep detail there. There's two levels of Hashem's unity. Yichud Elah and Yichud Tata. There's the lower level of unity, the higher level of unity. The first floor represents the lower level of unity. The higher floor represents the higher level of unity. So the Alter Rebbe lived in Yichud Elah, in the highest level of unity. And despite that, he heard the baby cry. He lived on Vehecher Ashtok, means he lived with Yichud Elah, the higher level of unity. <laughs> and in the highest level of unity, he heard the baby cry. Pleasure to have you. You look great today. The cook stories we are Thank you. I hope I can be here every day. The cook stories we are Menoira. The cook stories we are Menoira, Heinz. A Menoira. Dr. Rebbe says, somebody who just wants, to, wants to go out of Ra and become a Menorah. It's a beautiful definition of life, to become a Menorah. Yeah? Kollektive Ruach HaKodesh. The heist? Avort, huh? Klal Yisrael hot a kollektive Ruach HaKodesh. Klal Yisrael has collective Ruach HaKodesh. So you say, who, who? It comes out. Hotman collect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He gave a scream. Vedikid Besalen and the Rambam to the Kinder. Rabnochim Yeshikai Chacha. Beautiful job. This class is brought to you by the Yeshiva.net. 
please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.